Crossroads Media. What is going on, everyone? Big win for the Eagles. We're going to talk about it all and break down the madness. But first, if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up button. We party every day here talking about Philly sports. I don't know if party is the right word because sometimes it's devastating. But you get my point. Make sure you come join the party here. And look, if you're looking to buy tickets to any NHL, NBA, NFL game, you can go to SeatGeek and use the promo code BRODES at checkout for $20 off. You're basically eliminating the fees right from there. I'm giving you $20 in my hands. Take it from me. Get yourself to a game today. It is simple. Promo code BROAD, SeatGeek's checkout page. With that being said, enjoy the show. What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. The Philadelphia Eagles win 40-29. to They play smash-mouth football, and they come out victorious. And now they are sitting at 5-6, and six, and the conversation becomes interesting knowing that the schedule opens up the way that we've kind of been laying it out there on display. Now we're inching our way closer to it. And look, let's be realistic. You know, the way that they played in the first half, and yeah, we'll touch on what happened there later on, and it got close than it needed to be, and that relates to what happened last week with Vic Fangio. The only difference is, you know, last week Darius Slay and Davion Taylor put it away early where you didn't even need to see any more time or witness any more time of uncomfortableness. Today, that uncomfortable feeling lingered more than it needed to until Jalen Hurts put his foot into the ground and Granderson's ankles just blew off of his body. Both just completely collapsed to the ground. It looked like he was on ice skates that eventually happened but you know there were times where you wondered oh oh." and how about what the hell was Sean Payton thinking kicking that field goal and I think what it really tells you is I have no faith at all in my quarterback in Trevor Simeon which I thought was a little weird just considering I don't think it's weird to not have trust in him trust me he sucks and he's horrible I don't want to hear what he did in previous efforts this season he's not very good you saw that when and Jonathan Gannon brought some pressure. Vontae Maddox, Alex Singleton throwing blitzes his way. And when you don't have any playmakers out there, when your offensive line is in shambles trying to hold their own, that's the result you're going to get. So maybe it's just by, like, default. I don't know what you want me to do because nothing has worked with this guy all game long. But I thought the third down call before that was a little weird on the third and nine. Like, it, it set up where it looked like they were going to go for it on fourth but regardless my point is let's focus on the positives first and that first half was no joke and I touched on how banged up they were as a whole that is reality of the situation but let me give props to where I should give them props to whether it should look this way or not the fact that it did look this way when we're trying to analyze a young coaching staff and a younger led team and Jalen Hurts and all with Devontae Smith and younger players, while you have your Jason Kelsey's who threw a huge block for a big Miles Sanders run, and Jordan Mailata's out there throwing Davenport to the ground with one damn hand. It was ridiculous how strong he was throughout this game. You know, I find it valuable that this team was making the Saints look piss poor when they had piss poor talent. Because the alternative is they look good or they look serviceable or they look decent. No, no, no. That wasn't the case for that first half. It was meet me at the middle. And this Saints defense, they are good. They are respected. They have talent. The difference is Jalen Hurts' ability. You know, some of those plays, when you saw the replay of of Sanders and and, um, Jalen Hurts and the way that he kept the ball right there in the breadbasket for one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, waiting for the perfect time to either pull it and run himself or hand it off based off of what the defense was doing. It was very difficult, and I thought Jalen Hurts handled those moments very smoothly Well, you know, it it wasn't as if he had an insane day throwing. There were no throws like last week where you you had Quez Watkins wide open in the end zone or the Devontae Smith throw last weekend in Denver. There was nothing eye-popping that way, but there were still some nice things out there for sure. While it wasn't, you know, anything eye-popping, mind-blowing in that department, 
when you look at him, and I'm going to use this word, you can look at it positively or you can look at it negatively. I can't tell you how to analyze the quarterback position for what you're specifically looking for, but I thought he managed the game very well in that regards. Now, what I thought was very crucial in that first half was the third down conversions by the Eagles. That was the difference maker. The Saints had the ball first, right? After they did end up getting their first first down of the night on their opening drive, TJ Edwards with a fantastic tackle for loss. There was a failed screen. Now it's third and 11. You bring the pressure. You throw Avante Maddox his way, Trevor Simeon's way, which made him uncomfortable. Then the Eagles got the football. How about that Saints, well, with that Saints second drive, TJ Edwards, he's up by the line of scrimmage. He comes back and makes a ridiculous catch to put the Eagles in a great position to get on the scoreboard. And that's exactly what they ended up doing. Third and six to Goddard for a 16 yard game. Then third and six to Goddard once again, which probably should have been a touchdown for the newly paid tight end, the newly contract extension Philadelphia and Dallas Goddard. It seemed like he rolled over the defender, but regardless, it doesn't matter who got it. Jalen Hurts punched it in at the end anyway. Bang, 7 nothing. But the fact that third and six, third and six, go to Goddard, go to Goddard. I think it's fascinating that this type of game happened for Goddard because Tyrone Johnson and I were talking about this on the Fanatic over the weekend, he might have numbers that are awesome, and he might have numbers that you could relate to to other quarterback or to other tight ends in this league. But Dallas Goddard never truly had the monster, insane level of impact. When you think of Zach Ertz, you think of the true impact in so many damn games. Maybe Dallas Goddard had numbers and had solid catches and had nice receptions, had some touchdowns throughout his tenure here, but the level of intensity of his impact has never really been felt yet. Now you have the opportunity to do that as a number one tight end and committing to him fully. And then, oh, by the way, here's the payday. I thought it was a great response for him after that contract because today I absolutely a 1,000% felt that level of intensity, and that's why I want to bring that up. So then, third and four for the Saints, Simeon, LOL, I put down here in my notes, pressure, Avante Maddox makes a nice play. So you just see the difference in third downs from each team. One team's generating a lot of success, the other team can't figure out what the hell to do. So Sanders gets a 25-yard gain for the next Eagles possession. Kelsey with the major block. Third and two, 20-yard gain for Jalen Hurts. Then you had that crazy play at the end zone where Jalen Hurts runs to the right to the right pylon and scores the touchdown after they review the play and challenge the play. What bothers me about that sequence is I don't know what the hell they're trying to run in Wildcat with Jordan Howard previously to even set yourself up in that position late in third and goal to have to score in that moment, right? Like in what universe? I do feel that they try and get cute. They try and get fancy. They try and do too much, which is a common theme at times in the red zone, although they do do damage in the red zone too. I just, I don't know. Sometimes I feel they make it harder on themselves. I don't see what the fascination was with the Jordan Howard Wildcat scenario. But anyway, regardless, they do punch it in. Jalen Hurts, the way he was able to run to that right pylon to, to even put the ball over the pylon before he stepped out of bounds to make it 14-0. Let's not forget about the third down conversions throughout that drive. That was clearly a huge part of it. We roll into the second quarter. How about this? Third and eight at about midfield. Trevor Simeon just throws the ball right in the dirt. Now, did Josh Sweat get his fingertips, whether it was on the forearm or on the ball? Maybe it did seem like in the replay that was the case. But once again, pointing out a third down. Let's go to the Eagles. When the score is 14-7, and seven, because on third and goal, but it was pushed back because of a penalty, they had to go 18 yards. Trevor Simeon finds a beautiful seam, I should say. I mean, it was a great throw. TJ Edwards was in coverage. That was the tip of the cap for, for the Saints making a play on third down. But after that, Eagles, third and two. Jalen Hurts sitting in the pocket. So much time and space. It looked like Devontae Smith was open for 10 years. He hits Devontae Smith over the middle, sitting in the pocket. Time, 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 time. It's amazing what happens when your offensive line creates that pocket for you. He hits Devontae Smith, who goes on a major run for a 33-yard gain. 
Now, maybe it could even, this resulted in a field goal, a 50-yard field goal. And let's, let's give claps here to our guy, Jake Elliott, who has turned the corner big time compared to what we saw last season where we had so many question marks. Where is his confidence? How strong is he? How smooth is he? Uh-oh, what's happening? My man just sets it up and does nothing but cash in nonstop field goal after field goal after field goal. So let's give him some props for being able to, uh, to knock down some big time field goals here. 50 yarder. But who knows if Miles Sanders, see, Marcus Williams had a fantastic day. I thought he had some really strong plays out there and had some big time, whether it was knocking Devontae Smith out of bounds, that could have been a massive gain for the Eagles, or that Miles Sanders play where Miles Sanders was sitting there wide open and he was, what, looking to fall backwards instead of maybe target the football and move towards the football, but Williams comes from all the way across the side of the field to swat it out of bounds. You can look at Miles Sanders, say, look at his yards per carry and look at some of his touches and some of the positive things he did. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little bit disappointed in the overall Miles Sanders based off of putting the ball on the floor for the Saints to even score their first touchdown. That's unacceptable. That cannot happen. Then he does it again, but because his forward progress was stopped, Malcolm Jenkins was yanking it out. There were four or five guys trying to just strip the football out of his hands. Maybe it was the right call. It seemed to kind of be the right call, if I'm being honest. But my point is, that is unacceptable. Out of Sanders, and I thought that play where he was trying to fall backwards and Williams broke it up, that's on him as well. I don't have a problem with Nick Sirianni going back to Sanders. This is professional sports. This isn't little Jimmy, little league where you make one mistake and you're never going to see playing time again this or that like this is Miles Sanders this is a guy who is highly regarded in the league highly regarded on your team you drafted him high for a reason you know that he has a special skill set you put the football on the floor you give him a chance to redeem himself I'm okay with that honestly I look at that as good coaching and good relatability to your teammates you know look it happens stuff happens shake it off and get back out there it happens all the time with cornerbacks non-stop you get annihilated you get crushed don't worry about it let's get to the next play and make sure you're ready to be locked and loaded and dialed in so the next time someone targets you you get a pass breakup or hell maybe you get a pick six the other way sort of like Darius Lane that wasn't to say that he got torched anytime earlier I'm just saying maybe that's what you do if you have the proper mentality play in and play out forget about the last play and I'll tell you what I don't know why Simeon is even looking in his direction there was a third down earlier before that pick six right before the half where it's like, hey, we need a big first down here. Let's target Terry Slay. I mean, it's foolish football is what it is. If anything, why don't you look towards Steven Nelson's way because it seems Avante Maddox has figured things out and has been playing sharp. Although, yeah, you know what? In, in some garbage time, and I don't even know if it's fair to call it garbage time because there was enough time left to kind of have a little bit of a surge. But late in the game, yeah, you know what? Rodney McLeod and Avante Maddox, there was a throw that kind of went right through both of them. But ultimately, Steven Nelson's the guy to go after, No. It's foolish. It's bad. And, and so is Trevor Simeon, to be fair. So, yeah, with Miles Sanders, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you can see the skill level. You see the burst. There was another time, though, he runs out of bounds. A couple minutes late in the, left in the game. Jordan Maialata with a nice block that opens up a lane for Miles Sanders. You see what Jalen Hurts does at times where he just kind of falls. He sees that there's no play, and instead of trying to force something, he just slides and sits there on his butt. Yo, Miles, don't you know time and space? Aren't you aware? It's like he doesn't have those instincts. And I'll tell you, the same person, uh, another player that has a similar situation is Jalen Rager. I mean, he sets up the Eagles' first drive by catching that punt, which was a disaster. I have no idea what he's doing. There's no reason for teams to bite on any sort of movement with Jalen Rager because he stinks. And I've mentioned this before. I held on more than anybody else, but it's clear as day. Don't go look at what Justin Jefferson did today for Minnesota because my man is blowing my mind, making ridiculous uh, acrobat catches left and right. And Jalen Rager is not even a serviceable guy at this point. And if you go back to that first drive for the Eagles, it was third 
third and three. Jordan Howard was stuffed. They were running at a shotgun. The offensive line did get beat, but it was a tell. I mean, the tell was obviously that it was going to be a run. It's not as if Jordan Howard is some threat in the passing game, and they've already established their identity as a run-first team. And when you're trying to move Rager like this, it, it doesn't work. The other team doesn't look at Jalen Rager as some sort of threat that they need to focus in on, so they'd rather focus in on what has been moving the football for your team over the last handful of weeks, and that's why it ends up getting stuffed, and they weren't able to generate the success that they were looking for on the Eagles' opening drive. But I'll tell you what, the fact that they are committed to this and the best team in that area is having trouble. Now, it's different when you have the mobile quarterback in play compared to, let's say, a Tom Brady or someone who's just under center and does your traditional handoffs. There's a big difference in the way that you have to really determine your philosophy defensively. And you can tell the way that that Jalen Hurts, the, the way that teams had to really pick and decide as edge rushers and when they're looking to contain him, it makes it that much more difficult and opens up the lanes for some of these running backs. There was a beautiful Jordan Howard drive when the score was 17-7. to This drive led to another field goal to put the Eagles up 20-7. to Howard for 18. Howard for a gain. Howard for a first down. Howard for 14 yards. And it all really generated because of the threat of Hurts as well. Then on third and six, down Dallas Goddard makes a catch that was ridiculous. He was so swarmed. There was so much coverage in his face, but he had his hands right on the money. Bang, caught the football. Ended up scoring a touchdown, but it got called back because Devontae Smith set a pick that was clear and obvious of foul. He didn't even try in any way, shape, or form. Tried to sell the fact that he was running that route whatsoever, which pulled that touchdown off the board, and uh, then they ended up settling for a field goal as it got into first and 20, second and 20, third and 16. They tried to throw it to Devontae Smith in the end zone, but it was high and out of bounds, and there was some decent coverage there anyway, if I remember off the top of my head. So it wasn't as if, you know, it was anything missed. It was more of a, all right, it wasn't there. Let's kick these points in and kind of move forward from from that spot. But yeah, you know, it's just... um. You look at what they did and, and their smash mouth. It's no longer about, and, and I, I touched on this before. At some point, it's what do you dictate? What are you doing as the team? While, yes, you focus on the other team's flaws, you focus on what they're not good at, and that helps you game plan so you can put your team in the best position. Sometimes, if you're so good at what you do, you force the other team to change what they're trying to do to, to make it so they have to stop you. It's, wow, the Eagles are really good in this area. Make them sweat it out. Make them go back to the drawing board over and over and over again, nonstop, during the week to come up with something to fix themselves and to put them in the best position and try and stop your running game. But it's not that easy. And heading into today, we thought, well, Sean Payton has the advantage over Nick Sirianni from that offensive side standpoint. And I, I still believe that is the case. It's just what do you want one coach to do without Thomas, without Alvin Kamara, without a quarterback, without your offensive line? You know, right now, a hot topic around the 76ers is, well, they're losing a lot of games. But my point has been pretty consistent, which was that is supposed to happen when Joel's not playing, Danny's not playing, Matisse just had his first game back, but before this, he wasn't available, the whole Ben Simmons drama. Yeah, you're supposed to lose games when that's the case. Well, realistically, this is the way that this was supposed to look in the first half. Pure dominance, bring the pressure, make Simeon uncomfortable, put him in spots where he's making such a quick decision, and most likely, these backup quarterbacks and these guys that are barely hanging on to the lead in the league will make those mistakes a thousand percent and that's why he's forcing throws to Darius Slay side and that's why Alex Singleton is just rushing right through so it's the way it should have looked and I'll give them credit for that I won't back down and go they don't deserve credit because this is what it's supposed to look like no because I'm trying to figure out who this coaching staff is and the fact that Here's an area where we went into the action saying, well, advantage you, advantage Eagles in many different areas. How does that play out? Well, it played out the way that it should. That 
tells me something about Gannon. That tells me something about Nick Sirianni. Will it look the same if you're not playing the Teddy Bridgewaters, if you're not playing the Sam Darnolds, if you're not playing the Trevor Simeons? No, the answer is no. But that wasn't the case today. And through a 16-game schedule, I should say 17-game schedule at this point, sometimes you end up playing teams and it's about when you play them, not so much what that team's record is to that point. And right now, you're playing a team that is very vulnerable, and you are finally at home, ready to win a game, and the crowd was electric. That woman who was clearly pissed off, I believe, I'm sure everybody saw it on Twitter, it's the one woman that's mouthing something along the lines of, you gotta be fucking kidding me, or that's fucking bullshit. I forget exactly what the phrase was, and I love finding out later on that this woman somehow started Google, or she's like the president of some huge corporation who just gets shit-bombed on a Sunday afternoon after drinking 32 Miller Lights in the parking lot before we're heading into the Eagles game. I believe that was when it was Javon Hargrave who got called for that awful roughing the passer call, which helped the Saints have some life and generate a little bit of noise there. But here's what I'll say about that second half. Actually, before we get to that, let me tell you about my friends over at DeSimone Jewelers. They are my jeweler. I got my fiance's engagement ring from them, and it was the best decision of my life. They work with you to get the best design at the most reasonable price you will find in the market. It is a family-owned business located in Haddonfield, New Jersey, previously in Jewelers Row. Will, Lou, Nick, Mike, they are the best crew to work with. I can't even stress it to you enough how outstanding it is. You're not just a customer. They're not just there to make a quick dollar. They are so passionate about what they are providing for you. They break it down. They show you the clarity. They describe to you the differences in each diamond that they will show you. They bring you outside. They give you all these tools so you can study the difference in the diamond. It really is a fantastic experience, and you should absolutely experience it. Uh, They provide custom jewelry design, jewelry repairs, appraisals, watch repairs, diamond setting, jewelry cleaning, and so much more. Make sure you check them out down below, DeSimoneJewelers.com. Tell them that Broads sent you. So in the second half, I just can't pretend that what happened last week it was not real, and what happened this week was not real. There's something about these second-half adjustments that is really hurting this team. Now, Darius Slay ended up leaving with the concussion stuff. Davion Taylor was unavailable for you, so you were losing guys. Anthony Harris and McPherson are out there trying to make plays, and it's difficult for them to do so. I'm with you. I understand that you did lose some talent in the back end, but ultimately, all I'm saying is last week, without that play by Taylor and without that that fumble recovery brought back to the house by Darius Slay in three pass attempts. Two of them should have been extremely picked off by the Denver Broncos, and Vic Fangio brought out a whole new look, a whole new brand identity with this zone instead of bringing the pressure the way that he was in the first half, and that threw the the Eagles in for a loop. Now, there's so much time left. Who knows what would have happened? Maybe Nick Sirianni would have countered that adjustment and the Eagles would have been just fine. Maybe it would have stayed down that path where the Eagles were struggling to move the ball and forced to go three and out consistently and punted like we saw today where there was no action involved. There was no moving the chains. There was no moving the sticks for multiple drives. And, you know, it's just a common theme that I'm not going to make this a disappointing conversation from a big picture standpoint, but I will say it is highlighted in my brain and it is absolutely a thousand percent in my mind to watch as they continue these games. Now, when you look at the Jets, when you look at Washington, when you look at the Giants, I don't see, I like Ron Rivera as a coach. I don't know necessarily what he has roster wise, talent wise, although they had a win against Cam Newton and the Carolina Panthers today. Uh, You know, are are there coaches in Joe Judge and what's happening right now with the New York Jets that you are so fearful of where you're worried about that coaching battle, that chess match battle? No, not necessarily. And by the end, with the Dallas Cowboys, who knows exactly where they're going to be? Is that a throwaway game for them where it doesn't really matter and they're solidified in their certain playoff spot? Or is it something where their last game is going to matter for playoff seeding purposes and who they're going to match up against? So that really matters. Not that I'm very fearful 
respectful of Mike McCarthy specifically, but Kellen Moore in that offense, I think, is a reasonable conversation to have. Uh, I, I don't know. Like, if it does happen against these coaches, against Joe Judge and, and against uh, Robert Solano, then yeah, I mean, it would be very disappointing and extremely upsetting. So what I'll say is, for the second straight week, it's somewhat getting pushed to the side because of how strong their first half was. But at some point, we need to realize that this is a two-half game. It's not a one-half game. And sometimes you can put yourself in a good position to win the football game based off of how strong you were dialed in in the first half. But ultimately, and I'd say when you play better teams, that'll come back to bite you. But when you look at the rest of the schedule, you're not going to be playing better teams. So will it matter? I, I guess not. But for the long-term look at things, I think that's an area that both Jonathan Gannon and and Nick Sirianni need to get better at. When Jordan Howard leads, leaves the game, like if he's in there, is it as simple as you just run the rock a bunch of times and you get those first downs and you don't have to worry about punting the ball away and giving the football back to the New Orleans Saints? Maybe, maybe, but I do have to give credit to the one drive where they answered really with the... <laughs> I can't believe... Well, I can't believe they went to... When it was 33-22, when they kicked the field goal, the Saints did they went to Rager on the first play, which was a loser mentality. And then they find J.J. Ortega Whiteside for the big first down catch. What? What? J.J. Ortega Whiteside? What world are we living in? In what universe is this what we're watching? I couldn't believe it. Here I am jumping up and down. J.J. It's not just a blocker. He's not just J.J. I block as a wide receiver Whiteside. It's give me the yards, baby. It's can I save the season, J.J. Ortega Whiteside. It's mom, give me the umbrella, J.J. Ortega Whiteside. Oh, I'm pissing my pants at that point. Of course, then I had to watch Sanders run out of bounds, though. Oh, it is frustrating. But that was a big It was a big drive for not just that running out the clock. Obviously, Jalen Hurts scoring the touchdown was so massive. But there was a big answer, and it was... It was after the Saints, and this was in the second quarter, made it 14-7 to when Miles Sanders fumbled, and it was the third and goal that got pushed back, and they needed 18 yards on third down to score, and Simeon threw a nice pass into the end zone that TJ Edwards was there for the coverage, but it was a nice catch as well. Uh, they went right down the field, and albeit it wasn't necessarily a touchdown. No, it's not that it wasn't necessarily. It wasn't a touchdown. And you can question maybe the third and 12 call when the Saints only rushed three, and maybe there was some disguise in there, if I remember that play correctly. Of course, we always have to go back and uh, study exactly what went down after the, the first look, but you get down and, and you score a field goal. And uh, I know it's not anything massive. It's not responding with a touchdown, but it's responding with points. And I value those points in that situation that uh, that matters to me. It absolutely a thousand percent matters to me. So what I want to do right now is go to um, Nick Sirianni and hear what he kind of had to say after the game. There are different ways to be physical. Receivers can be physical, and the tight ends can be physical, and backs. It's a style of play. Tough guys on this team. When you get on the bus to go to a game, you never want to go to a game without your guys that are tough. Well, yeah, they definitely play tough. I mean, that's absolutely a 1,000% the way that we define this team right now. When you're going up against them, it's damn here we go. It's going to be a battle. I got to bring guys down to the ground. They're going to get those yards and put themselves at third and a reasonable distance. And you know what? It's kind of laid out perfectly with what I thought it was going to be with the preview podcast. I said, look, normally we've been seeing them get into third and two, third and three, third and one, third and manageable, which at times it did happen today. But knowing how strong the Saints defense is, what happens when it's third and six? So yeah, you are getting some yards there to set yourself up for not necessarily third third and long, but not third and one either. It's more third in that middle range where bang, you're finding Dallas Goddard. Bang, you're finding Dallas Goddard. Bang, you're finding Devontae Smith for a 33-yard gain. So, you know, they were able to execute the third downs. I remember watching that first quarter play out, the first quarter specifically, and it bled into that second. You know, wow, there's something to be said about their conversions in that area, and that keeps your team on the field. It keeps the other team off the field, although I'm not very scared of Trevor Simeon and that offense gaining more time. Uh, but with more on Nick Sirianni, he admitted that he got too conservative in the second half, which allowed the Saints to climb back into the game. Acknowledge that Jay Jaw's big play in the fourth quarter. Uh, I love JJ. I think embodies the toughness of this city. Oh, come on, coach. Don't be sucking up, coach. Don't be sucking up, my friend. 
We have tough, gritty guys. Nick Sirianni on the team and why he can win with them. Well, here, here's what I'll say about Nick Sirianni. I don't believe this is how he thought that his offense would go. I don't think when he headed into this season, his mentality was, I, I know exactly how this team's going to operate to be the best brand. And that's why I think it's funny because, look, I saw this as a six-win football team. It's clear they're going to have more than that. But there were some that said 11, 10, and those people now are, are boasting. Putting their chest out. And fine, you can act however you want to act when things happen that way. Uh, But my thing is, it's like, oh yeah, I'm sure you really thought that this team with Jordan Howard was going to be such a monstrous run-heavy team and they were just going to annihilate teams this way. right? I mean, that's just not the case. Yeah, Jalen Hurts is making plays with his legs and Jalen Hurts is making throws when he needs to make throws and things can be sharper in the pocket. But come on now, you're telling me this is what you saw? Jordan Howard coming off of the practice squad? You saw the difference in how this team operated with him on the field and without him on the field. So please, I mean, this is a pleasant surprise and we're all stoked that there's some energy. Remember, a handful of weeks ago, it felt like a job. It felt like a chore. It felt painful watching this team, sort of like what we witnessed when Doug Peterson was here. Now it's, damn, we have a chance to win and we have a chance to compete at a high level and win football games every time they touch the field on Sunday over the last couple of weeks. And that's going to continue when you look at their opponents moving forward. So, I mean, it's, it's great. And Nick Sirianni, getting back to the point I wanted to bring, you know, I I give him credit because he's willing to adapt to this where I don't know if many coaches would. Some coaches would think, no, 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 we're going to pass, we're going to pass. This isn't my lifestyle. This isn't the way that I handle things. I normally play this a different way. Uh, No, no, I'm not going to commit. But he saw the progression. He saw how it helped the quarterback as well. The quarterback had too much on his plate. You don't throw as much, you get more. You ask for less, you get more. The ability, or I should say, the opportunity to make mistakes aren't as high. You limit those opportunities to make the mistakes. And he's cashing in on the plays he needs to make. Making plays with his legs. Wasn't perfect, but it was good. It was damn good. And I'm just excited to see this team buy into this. Now, when you ask Nick, hey Nick, what's your your identity? You think he's going to give us a, well, I don't know if teams know their identity by now. You know, everyone kind of has to learn their identity each week. You ask a lot of these coaches, they'll say they don't know. (laughs) Nick, that's why we laughed at you in the past because that was a stupid answer. Because teams do have identities, and they know what they're all about. And if we asked you what your team identity is, you'd say this. And let's not act as if you know now because it's been 11 weeks. You've only been running the football for a handful of weeks. So when we asked you that question in the beginning of the season, it's really been the same amount of games of actually establishing this style. It hasn't been the full 11 weeks. It's only been a handful of weeks. And that's when we asked you the, the question originally. But I'm liking Nick. He's trending in the right direction. Gannon, still have my concerns when you're not playing the Simeons, when you're not playing the Bridgewaters, when you're not playing those style of quarterbacks, the Sam Darnolds. I have my concerns, but we'll see. I'm not saying it's impossible for him to take this information of third downs, blitzing, sending pressure, Maddox, right? I'm not saying it's impossible, but is it the same way if there's a competent quarterback on the other side with an offensive line that doesn't have insanely injured offensive linemen, both tackles and and linemen in the interior and all, if they're a structured group, does he have the confidence to send the same style? I hope he looks at this and, and, and... shows himself that there's some sort of success that could generate from it because it's not rocket science, but I don't know if you can get away with it to the same level either. We'll find out. I'm excited, though. It's a good win. It's a good win. It's a good win. Before I let you go, let me tell you about WinView. Are you tired of getting fleeced by the house? Are you tired of spending time researching players and teams only to end up short? Welcome to WinView. WinView is the only app where skill elevates you into the competition and into the money. Forget about spread, salary, caps, and over-unders. All you need to do is answer questions about the game that you love. They have a deposit bonus right now that they are doubling up to $100. For all first-time users, if you deposit $50, you'll get $100. If you deposit and spend $100, you'll get $200. This is the perfect bonus to take advantage of during the NFL, MLB, 
NBA, NHL season. Answer questions. That's it. It's so simple. You answer questions about each game. Guess what? I'm becoming a sneakerhead. I'm nonstop on StockX, on the sneakers app, on Go, and I can't stop buying shoes. Well, why am I getting, or how am I getting that money, I should say? Oh, Thank you, Winview. That could be you as well. Check it out down below, winview.tv slash bros. I want to thank you all so much for listening, and I will see you next time. 